On this Friday night, another Canadian politician whose sources allege was part of a Chinese interference network. The details of the claims and the Ontario MPP's denials. This is uh, false accusation. Global News investigates. Legal problems, why Donald Trump will likely get hit with criminal charges and what that could mean for his bid for the White House. Cracking down on migrants, the UK's contentious plan to curb illegal immigration. Plus, fighting racism using virtual reality. He's so touchy about his name. To address a very real problem. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Nibu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with an update on a global news investigation into allegations of foreign interference in Canada's 2019 federal election. Intelligence sources have identified several alleged members of a covert network that sources say facilitated the transfer of funds from the Chinese consulate. And sources say the recipients included a member of Doug Ford's Ontario Conservative government. Jeff Semple has the exclusive details in tonight's top story. When Doug Ford's Ontario Conservatives swept to power in 2018, a little-known candidate quietly made history. I'm fortunate to have one of the best MPPs around in Ontario, Vincent, my friend. Vincent Ke became the first immigrant from mainland China to be elected Ontario Conservative MPP. The member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But intelligence sources say the MPP was also part of an alleged foreign interference network to advance Beijing's political agenda. During the 2019 federal election campaign, sources say the Chinese consulate transferred around $250,000 through a network. It involved at least 11 federal candidates, campaign staffers and other politicians, both liberal and conservative including Liberal MP Hon Dong, who has denied the allegations. The funds were allegedly sent first through a businessman, Wei Cheng Yi. Then sources say the money flowed to a federal candidate staff member and to Ke, who received about $50,000. Okay, thank you, thank you. The allegations stem from interviews with Canadian intelligence sources, including a senior official with detailed awareness of the CSIS investigations. Global News is not able to independently verify the allegations made by CSIS against Ke, Wei or Dong. This is a false accusation. This is racist. I told him in the email already. You say it's racist? Why is it it's racist? It's racist because I was born in China, because I come from China. So you never received fifty thousand dollars from no, the Toronto nothing, Consulate. Nothing. This is how they always play the uh, race card. They use the racism, you know, label someone racism, to um, uh, distract the real issue here. Jack Jay is the editor of this Toronto area Chinese newspaper. This is a story we, we produced. He's produced reports which are banned on the popular Chinese messaging app WeChat investigating Ke's political activities. He says Ke has appeared at events with Chinese consulate officials and pro-Beijing groups like the Tibetan Association of Canada which promotes Chinese rule in Tibet. So this is very outrageous. There is so many conflict of interest. In a statement, Ke said he has a responsibility of attending a multitude of events hosted by a wide range of ethnic communities to maintain a relationship with all his constituents. He believed the Tibetan Association was simply another group that supported Tibetan Canadians. The other alleged intermediary, businessman Wei Cheng Yi, shown here in 2014, also denied any involvement. In a written statement, he called the report a complete fabrication, inexplicable and total nonsense. Liberal NP Han Dong wrote, I am unaware of the claims provided to you by alleged sources, which contain seriously inaccurate information. We know there is ongoing interference in Canada. The Prime Minister publicly supported Dong and said the alleged interference in the 2019 election did not influence the overall outcome. Trudeau promised to name a special rapporteur to investigate the claims, but stopped short of calling a full public inquiry. Trudeau government should be open answer this question. It's uh, not just uh, for the security of our, or democracy of our country. It's also for Chinese community itself. 
Now, unlike the UK and Australia, Canada has no foreign interference legislation, meaning there's nothing illegal per se about transferring money in the way this network is alleged to have done. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. And a minor cabinet shuffle tonight means Vincent Ka is out as the public and business service delivery minister's parliamentary assistant. The Ontario Premier's office says in part, while the allegations against Mr. Ka are not proven, they're serious and deserve his full and undivided attention as he works to clear his name. Beijing took aim at Ottawa today, accusing Canada of smearing its reputation over allegations Chinese government officials are secretly running two so-called police stations in Quebec. In a daily briefing, China's foreign ministry said Beijing has been abiding by international law and called on Canada to stop sensationalizing and hyping the matter. Yesterday, RCMP in Quebec confirmed they were investigating what they call foreign state-backed criminal activities at two centres in Montreal and Brossard, a suburb south of the city. It's believed Beijing has set up more than 100 of them around the world to monitor, harass and in some cases repatriate Chinese citizens living abroad. That investigation adds to the mounting allegations of Chinese interference in Canada's internal affairs and fuels the growing calls for the federal government to take action. Today, Ottawa announced the beginning of a long-awaited tool to help fight foreign interference. But as Mackenzie Gray reports, for many, it's too little too late. It's the first step of a recent promise to fight foreign interference. I'm announcing the launch of consultations to guide how we will set up a new foreign influence transparency registry in Canada. The goal of a registry? To shed light on individuals paid to influence the Canadian political process on behalf of other states, like China, Russia or Iran. Countries intelligence officials have warned for years are meddling in Canadian affairs. But the consultations don't come with a timeline for legislation. We have laid the foundation for a, a conversation that will be sure that we get this mechanism right. It is not an uncomplicated, straightforward exercise. Minister Mendicino. That conversation has already been happening in the Senate, where a bill to create the new tool was proposed over a year ago. Legislation the public safety minister said he supported. I certainly think that's an idea that, uh, that mer uh, merits a, a study. I agree that um, this is a pressing and, and urgent um, issue. A key concern, how to make sure various diaspora are not unfairly targeted by a potential registry. We have a great responsibility to ensure that we are not unfairly or unintentionally creating a cloud that hovers over an entire community. But experts from those communities want the government to bring in the new tool. The Chinese Canadian community welcome this foreign agent registry. A, monitor, a registry on a foreign agent is not the same as a registry on all Chinese Canadians. The idea of a registry isn't a new one. The U.S. has had one since the 1930s, and recently Australia implemented one. I think the advantage is more public relations. But this former CSIS intelligence official believes legislation to deter foreign interference would be more powerful than a registry. The enablers and facilitators of foreign influence activities, uh, their activities are generally clandestine. They're not going to be signing up for a registry. Once the consultation period closes in two months, the government will turn to drafting legislation. But today, Marco Mendicino wouldn't say if the Liberals would commit to having the registry in place in time for the next election. Nithu? Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thanks, Mackenzie. China's Xi Jinping has secured a historic third term as president following a largely ceremonial vote at the National People's Congress in Beijing. The nearly 3,000-member Congress voted unanimously for Xi Jinping to serve another five-year term as president. The unprecedented vote comes after the Chinese legislature moved to abolish a two-term limit on the presidency in 2018, putting Xi on track to remain in power for life. The federal government is clawing back more than $82 million in health transfers to eight provinces. The health minister says some patients are being charged for medically necessary care. It is critical that access to medically necessary services, whether provided in person or virtually, remains based on medical need and free of charge. 
Duclo says he is concerned some people have been paying out of pocket for ultrasounds, MRIs and CT scans. He sent letters to all provinces and territories warning medically necessary health care is covered no matter where you live. Health care will be a big part of the 2023 federal budget. Today, Finance Minister Christian Freeland announced it will be released on March 28th. She says the government is focused on fiscal restraint and won't be pouring fuel on the flames of inflation. Google Canada says it will end its test of blocking news search results for some Canadians. The test started early last month in response to legislation that would see big tech companies pay news organizations for linking content. It led to MPs berating Google Canada's managing director during a committee meeting in Ottawa today. I think that you intentionally intended to make Canadians aware of it so that we would be afraid to pass C-18 in the Senate because of the threat that you would block news content. We're conducting tests to understand product impact on uh, legislation that's not finished. Google's test affected all types of news and impacted an estimated 1.2 million Canadian users. The test ends on March 16th. Ottawa has now approved WestJet's takeover of Sunwing Airlines, clearing the runway for a major shakeup in the airline industry. Transportation Minister Omar Al-Gabra signed off on the deal today, despite concerns raised by Canada's competition watchdog, suggesting the merger will likely result in higher airfares and reduced services. The deal was first announced in March of 2022. The British Prime Minister was in Paris today, announcing a new deal to tackle the migrant crisis. Rishi Sunak says Britain will pay France nearly $800 million to help stop migrants from travelling in small boats across the English Channel. We're announcing a new detention centre in northern France, a new command centre bringing our enforcement teams together in one place for the first time, and an extra 500 new officers patrolling French beaches. Sunak says there will also be more drones and surveillance to help intercept migrants. France is also expected to contribute funding. Critics, though, say the plan won't work. The UN says it breaches international law. As Redmond Shannon reports, no matter what, Sunak hopes the hardline approach will give him a boost in the polls. Good evening. Three simple words on a lectern to articulate what could be a complex legal process for British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Entering the UK illegally in small boats has more than quadrupled in just the last two years. 45,000 people crossed the English Channel this way last year. Almost all applied for asylum, even those from relatively safe countries like Albania. We will detain those who come here illegally and then remove them in weeks, either to their own country if it is safe to do so, or to a safe third country like Rwanda. Rwanda, a reference to a deal the UK made to send asylum seekers to the East African nation and into its immigration system. That plan is currently bogged down in the courts. The British Interior Minister admits this proposal could face the same fate. We are also uh, pushing the boundaries and we're testing innovative and novel legal arguments. The United Nations Refugee Agency says the plan would be a clear breach of its refugee convention. Immigration experts say it would effectively treat asylum seekers as criminals. If such removal is not in line with the European Convention, then the the United Kingdom might have to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. Belarus, Russia and Vatican City are the only other European countries that have not signed the Convention. For the last 10 years, our government has followed policies based on deterrence and none of them have had any impact on people crossing the Channel, so why should this be any different? On Wednesday, Sunak called the British opposition leader Keir Starmer a lefty lawyer standing in his way. If and when this plan faces legal challenges, it's likely we'll hear more of that rhetoric from the governing Tories. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Coming up, Donald Trump may make history for all the wrong reasons.
In the U.S., there are signs former President Donald Trump could be indicted on criminal charges. The case relates to Trump's alleged role in a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. Our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco joins us now. Jackson? Neetu, if Donald Trump is indicted, it would mark the first time a former American president has ever been charged with a crime. The case relates to an alleged $130,000 hush money payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels just days before the 2016 election. Daniels claims she had an affair with Trump. Trump denies it. In recent months, several people close to Trump have met with Manhattan prosecutors, including Trump's former attorney Michael Cohen, who's at the center of the alleged payments to Daniels. The Manhattan district attorney has now reportedly invited the former president to testify before a grand jury as early as next week. It's a sign criminal charges are likely on the way because New York law requires potential defendants to be given the option to testify. As far as this charge goes, it's not the most serious charge. But look, it's something you have to take seriously. And the fact that one prosecutor makes the decision to indict might make it actually easier for other prosecutors to make the same decision in different cases with more serious consequences. Now, it's expected Trump will decline the offer to testify, but he still faces multiple other legal challenges. A grand jury in Georgia has recommended several indictments as prosecutors there weigh charges in efforts to interfere in the 2020 election. And the Justice Department has ongoing federal investigations underway, including into Trump's role in the January 6th attack and the classified documents recovered from his home. Trump, of course, continues to insist that the probes are all politically motivated, and he has made it clear that even if he is indicted, he plans to continue his run for president in 2024. Nithu? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks, Jackson. Shocked and saddened ahead the aftermath of a deadly shooting in Hamburg, Germany. German investigators are searching for a motive after a lone gunman carried out a mass shooting, killing six people. According to police, the shooter, a 35-year-old man who later killed himself, was a former member of the Jehovah's Witness congregation that he targeted. Crystal Gamansing reports on the violent rampage and what authorities know about the suspect. Hamburg police say a former Jehovah's Witness armed with a legally obtained semi-automatic gun acted alone. We are, sind schockiert. we are shocked, says the regional spokesperson for the Jehovah's Witnesses. We found out about this rampage about an hour after it happened. Cell phone video captured the man identified by police as Philip F. approaching the building Thursday night. You can hear rounds being fired and you can see a figure near a window. That's where police say he forced his way into the building. European media outlets report the shooter was carrying a backpack with 20 additional magazines. That's roughly 300 bullets. All the fatalities are of German nationality, and each died from gunshot impact. It's possible the death toll could still rise. Police say at least four others suffered life-threatening gunshot wounds. Jehovah's Witnesses, it's worth noting, do not accept blood transfusions. In Munich, the German chancellor addressed the tragedy. Late last night, there was a terrible incident in my hometown of Hamburg. Several people have become victims of a brutal act of violence. Authorities confirmed Friday they were tipped off about Philip F. having a weapon and possibly struggling with his mental health. Uh, what is shocked, saddened, also afraid. The 35-year-old shooter turned his gun on himself after police entered the building. Nine empty magazines were reportedly found near his body. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Simulating solutions. Next, how virtual reality is being used to tackle a real-world problem. Virtual reality is often associated with gaming, but it has the power to make lasting change in the real world, too. For the new reality, Farah Nasser explores how a Canadian educator is using VR to help people address racial discrimination in real time. 
Even though this is virtual reality, interactions like this happen daily in the real world. A classmate asks your Asian friend to tutor him for his math exam because they just know math, am I right? In VR, these avatars help users explore unconscious bias. He's so touchy about his name. Michael Avis specializes in education and technology. He was curious to see if the immersive world of VR could be used in anti-racism training. Virtual reality is very good at putting you into that situation and feeling a visceral empathy or feeling a connection. It was an idea he'd had for a while, but he saw the need for a tool like this during the pandemic, witnessing his kids' online classes. It's Black History Month. There was a lot of sort of they and them statements. Mm. And the teacher, she's a wonderful teacher. So how do we help her think about the language that she's using? So Michael partnered with Body Swaps, a VR and AI company in the UK. And together they created a program called Let's Talk About Race. It allows participants to identify unconscious biases and practice how to call them out. You know that sounds racist, right? Their program is one of several VR platforms educating about race, diversity, and equity. Courtney Cogburn wanted to help people understand structural racism as it affects someone throughout their life. Look at your reflection in the mirror. It starts very early in life, um, and it it occurs across the life course. Users embody Michael Sterling, a black male, as he faces racism... Can I help you? ...in three stages of his life, as a child, an adolescent, and a Yale graduate in the workforce. You must be our candidate from Yale. Uh, No, sir. It's about observing white racism from a black perspective, which is a really different orientation, and not about performing as a black person, as as a black avatar. The VR experience is just one part of the bigger picture to combat systemic racism, but there are signs it's effective over the long run. Cogburn has data showing that white participants in her program experienced a shift in perspective on issues of racism even 14 weeks later. They felt more open to difficult conversations about race. Neetu. Farah Nasser in Toronto. Thanks, Farah. To learn more about how VR is helping in the fight against racism, you can watch Farah's story on The New Reality Saturday at 7 p.m. right here on Global. And that is Global National for this Friday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight's Your Canada is Cottage Pond in Mackesons, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thanks so much for watching. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a great night.